Greetings fellow men, servus Männer, it's Red Pill Germany again and today I want to talk about genetic diversity and where we are coming from. So I guess this question is a very fundamental question and I remember that in the 80s when I was a little kid my father took us to a museum of natural history and I remember seeing a model or a sculpture of a Neanderthal and then there was a world map and it showed where they lived and where the archaeologists found them and stuff and I asked my father dad did we live together with them did we live side by side or is it like the dinosaurs that they died out and they went extinct before we came to Europe and stuff and my dad told me oh well we lived side by side but we were stronger and we uh, displaced them you know because um, modern humans are, were more advanced and, and, and they displaced Neanderthal and that was I think at that time was really the, the official version of um, our common ancestors that Homo sapiens came out of Africa and um, from the Ice Age, you know, there was an earlier uh, human group or archaic human group, Neanderthal, uh, living in Europe um, who came out of Africa earlier and they lived side by side but then uh, Neanderthal got extinct, went extinct and yeah, sapiens still lives there now. That was the official version. So you can definitely see that uh, children are naturally interested in that and uh, humans have an interest in these questions. Where do we come from? Uh, who were our ancestors? How did they live? Blah, blah, blah. Uh, but this official version that my dad told me back then is not really the current version anymore. Because I think it was in 2010 when uh, researchers found evidence that there was actually interbreeding taking place between Neanderthal and modern humans. And that we still carry Neanderthal DNA in us today. And actually all people in the world except for Africans uh, have Neanderthal DNA. So that was um, DNA that was extracted from bones they found in Croatia and modern technology is so accurate that you can actually uh, sequence the DNA of a bone fragment you can extract DNA out of that and sequence that and the instruments are actually precise enough to get the full DNA out of it with just a tiny sample size actually. So but this was only the first finding. This technology has been used to investigate more uh, bone findings or archaeological uh, findings all over the world. For example in the uh, Denisova cave in uh, Siberia in the Altai mountain range and this cave was um, actually inhabited by um, Neanderthal but also by another early archaic uh, humanid species that uh, was called after that then the Denisova human. And then of course the DNA was extracted and it was compared with DNA samples from all around the world, from all different ethnic groups around the world and a world map was compiled where you can see what the contribution of this Denisova human is to modern people all around the world. In Southeast Asia but all around Eastern Asia actually the contribution of Denisova is actually pretty large. So here on this table you can see a sketch of the currently known interbreeding events that uh, scientists uh, compiled based on these archaic human remains and the extracted DNA samples and their sequencing data and you can see that there is even a mystery species here that interbred with Denisova and that carried its genes through the interbreeding event into modern Asian people actually and it might be that this is an early version or an, a version of Homo erectus actually, the Asian version of Homo erectus and that is one of our um, forefathers basically so that would mean that Asian people got an infusion directly with erectus DNA after leaving Africa actually which is rather fascinating. And so now you can see that people from all around the world except for Africans actually or Sub-Sahara Africans actually have um, genetic uh, admixtures of several archaic humans uh, that are kind of related to us or um, that are our common forefathers basically like uh, Denisova, like Neanderthal and maybe even Homo erectus. 
So, but why did these admixtures prevail? Why, why did they stay in the genome of modern people? So, one really nice example is the people in Tibet, in the high Tibetan plateau. So, as you know, the oxygen content of the air, of this thin air up there, is really low. And apparently, Denisova had a gene that allowed for the regulation of hemoglobin uh, in this environment and makes it easier for the carrier then to uh, survive or to survive well, to thrive in this low oxygen environment. And it seems like that the people that live in Tibet actually borrowed that gene from Denisova. So before Denisova went to Southeast Asia, he uh, stayed long enough in that region so that there was interbreeding with Asian uh, people and uh, they could borrow that gene or take that gene, incorporate, assimilate that into their genetics and uh, this proved to be very effective for um, settling in uh, this high altitude. So scientists also believe that Neanderthal and Denisova gave us a stronger immune system so that we can battle diseases and parasites. Now I find this entire story really fascinating and on one conference uh, scientists actually said that um, this um, early uh, Europe or Eurasia or something, you really have to imagine it like uh, the Lord of the Rings Middle Earth kind of, that there are several species or, or groups actually like dwarfs and hobbits and elves and people and stuff, you know, and they all live side by side and they have mixed kids actually. And um, in some cases these mixed populations did much better than the pure race or pure blooded uh, quote unquote um, groups. And this is why we still find traces of them in our genome today. It seemed to make us smarter, stronger and just more able to adapt to new environments. So I think from this data it is safe to say that um, genetic diversity is really a trump card in the game of evolution. Of course not all mixtures survived and not all interbreeding events uh, made it to today, but the ones that were successful, the ones that proved uh, to be uh, advantages, they survived until this day. Yeah, so this story, this fascinating story is really just another example of how it was really good that science left uh, philosophy behind kind of and monkey branched over to technology to uh, be now engaged in a very fruitful marriage with technology. So you see this uh, fruitful cycle, you know, um, science has a theory, um, technology comes up with a new better instrument like microscopes by which we were able to discover microbes and then find the reason for infectious diseases saving millions of lives and also for example the gravitational wave detector LIGO I mean since Einstein every physicist knows that there are gravitational waves no physicist really doubted that it was just a matter of um, finding them and finding experimental proof which is very hard to do but now recently the LIGO detector with a quantum mechanically squeezed light sources that have lower noise that break the noise limit of classical light and a super stable interferometer actually managed to experimentally find gravitational waves coming from the collision of two black holes I believe and uh, this was a big sensation but um, the reason why we can do that is breakthroughs in laser technology of course. This breakthrough about um, the findings in, of our past, of our ancestors is really coming from improved uh, experimental apparatuses, improved DNA sequencing methods that you can find for example here at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig in Germany where um, the German taxpayer is actually funding research that we give freely to the whole human race indiscriminately. So if you're interested in the methods and how these researchers actually do their work you can check their website. I linked it also down in the description below. And now towards the end I just want to get one more thought out there. It's, it's more of an association or a comparison but it seems to me that if you want to improve, if you want to develop your character or improve yourself, you really got to get out of your comfort zone. And this is what journeymen do for example in Germany. It's like if you um, 
finished your apprenticeship and before you actually can become a master, you have to go out to the world for several years and travel around and take up different kinds of work and meet new different people in new environments. And um, also young scientists are more or less bullied into, uh, for good reason I think, <laughs> bullied to um, going abroad and spending time abroad in the foreign research laboratories so that they find out how stuff is done there and they make connections and they get new uh, impressions and maybe get inspired. And uh, I think this is what happened to us humans too when we left the Garden of Eden, yeah? <laughs> when we went out of Africa into strange new environment with new flora and fauna and with different climate, different geology. And we had to somehow survive there. We had to uh, get along in this new environment. And the only way we could do that is by becoming really smart and clever and uh, by adapting and that means that the intelligence bell curve is moving every generation to the right because the stupid ones they win the Darwin award and they eat some kind of poisonous plant or they just uh, don't know what the hell they're doing in this new continent and they die and the smarter ones have actually more offsprings and they survive so that means the intelligence curves moves generation by generation little by little to the right and why is that because they went out of their comfort zone they don't do things like they have always been done for generations but they're forced they have to try new things they have to develop new tools etc yeah? and this is how you get smarter and this was true for our ancestors in Asia and in Europe and it is also true for the individual person and this is why I would really tell young people to get out into the world take a job even though welfare pays just the same doesn't matter get out there get experience do stuff that's that doesn't necessarily come easy to you of course at the same time you should focus on your strength never forget about that but you should go out of your comfort zone you should also try things that don't come natural to you that are not easy for you so that your brain can develop and to become productive and capable I think that's very important and it's just funny how you can see that with individuals and you also see that with mankind in general so as a last note I would say this whole um, Nazi Germany hypothesis of pure Aryan blood and racial purity is so uh, superior and stuff I think if you look really at the data at the history of man you can really say okay I mean not all combinations might be advantages not everything works but to say that um, basically inbreeding or is a good thing is kind of really outdated I mean maybe if you are culturally um, homogeneous you have a social cohesion which creates peace and stability and that's a good thing but genetically I think uh, mixing it up a little bit can if you mix it with the right people of course um, it is a good idea I think it can only make us stronger and we have to bend and not break of course that means survival of the fittest not survival of the strongest the people who can adapt the best they are the ones who survive in the end so this is of course a very new field of science I mean 2010 not that long ago I hope this is not some kind of hoax like that Japanese guy who claimed that he had found the oldest human remains ever and then it was a completely fabricated story of lies but um, yeah I think this is more serious science and I will definitely have an eye on these institutes and I will follow their research uh, this is a highly fascinating field to me and I think we're just at the beginning like they say jokingly at these conferences a little joke in their community there is always another interbreeding event so that's all for today uh, have a great day servus kameraden